Hello, Overcomers, and welcome to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. I'm Runsi, the founder of Overcome, and today we are joined by a very special guest and a longtime friend and champion of Overcome, Dr. Joseph Lucci. So Dr. Lucci is the Director of Gynecologic Oncology at UT Physicians UT Health, and his clinical interests include the uh, treatment of gynecologic cancers, cervical cancer, HPV, and ovarian cancer, which is, of course, in the family of gynecologic cancer. Cancers. He strongly believes that the goal of cancer treatment is to encourage patients to live life to the fullest, we agree, while obtaining the highest quality of care. And his focus is on the patient's needs and desires and to ensure a high level of comfort and compassion. Dr. Lucci has been named one of America's top doctors in recognition of his top level medical expertise. So we have a lot to chat with Dr. Lucci today about better understanding the survivorship in ovarian cancer from a medical as well as physiological standpoint. So join us for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Have your coffee ready. I have mine to chat with Dr. Lucci about all things survivorship in ovarian cancer. And if you have any questions as we go along, please type in the comment sections below and we will get it addressed post the discussion. So with that, a huge welcome to you, Dr. Lucci, to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. All it's such an honor to have you with us. Well, thank you, Renzi. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So several questions, uh, but I'll start with uh, when someone is just diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Tell us what they should know about the different histological types of ovarian cancer and the unique risk factors that are associated with it. And how do the these differences translate into treatment decisions that is that could be relevant information for all our overcomers listening. Yeah. So that's a really broad question, and I'm going to try and narrow it down a little bit for the audience. So uh, when we talk about ovarian cancer, we're actually talking about potentially four different disease processes. Um, within the ovary, you can have uh, epithelial ovarian cancer, which is by far the most common and the one we're most likely to be talking about today. And then next we have germ cell tumors um, and we have stromal tumors and then a category of other, which includes everything from lymphoma to sarcomas. Um, for the interest of today's discussion, we're gonna focus on the most common, which is epithelial ovarian cancer. Those can be divided into four categories as well. And um, those four, well, five categories technically. So you have um, high-grade serous or serous carcinomas, uh, endometrioid. Endometrioid cancers look a lot like the cancer that comes from the endometrial cavity. Um, we have clear cell carcinomas, which tend to arise within endometriosis. And, um, and we also have um, uh, another category there as well, which is rarer tumor types um, and mucinous carcinomas. Um, mucinous carcinomas look like gastrointestinal tumors. They're treated like gastrointestinal tumors and they're pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to talk too much about those unless somebody has a specific question. The, the ones that I would like to focus on today are the high-grade serous, which is the most common, and the endometrioid, which um, is the next most common. Uh, of those, they tend to present um, with a variety of vague symptoms, um, abdominal bloating, discomfort, dis uh, inability to eat properly, uh, constipation, increased urinary frequency, a variety of other um, symptoms that are not typically associated with the ovary. Mm -hmm. And so it takes somebody with a certain amount of um, insight to understand that these things may in fact be coming from the ovary and start looking uh, for the disease there. Absolutely. Once the patient presents and is diagnosed, there's a number of different things that, um, that can impact on what we do next. The patient's general physical status, um, how much cancer we see to be present, uh, their ability to undergo surgery or chemotherapy, and the patient's desires as to what they would like to accomplish. Absolutely. So um, 
Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Luigi. So what percentage of patients in ovarian cancer actually relapse? We we are going to spend a lot of time on re uh, recurrence and uh, maintenance therapies and all and such. So uh, before we started that, I just wanted to know uh, off the top of your head, what, what percentage of patients in ovarian cancer relapse and what does typically a typical recurrence look like based on age and stage in ovarian cancer? So um, focusing again, primarily on the epithelial ovarian cancers, they, um, they do have a high risk of recurrence, uh, about 80% overall. Mm. And time to recurrence varies depending upon um, patient's initial treatment and initial response to therapy. And again, their ability to tolerate uh, treatment and what treatments they received. Um, the recurrences typically um, can fall into two categories. One is where we detect it um, either by blood tests or by imaging, or the other would be when patients come back with symptoms, such as recurrence of ascites or the bloating and all the other symptoms that we talked about initially. So when they, when they come back with those kinds of symptoms, usually the cancer's um, fairly advanced again and the treatment options may be a little bit different than if the patient does not have any symptoms. So going back to just what you said for a second, you said that you know in certain situations, patients come back with symptoms and that's when you can diagnose that this person, ha person has recurred. So um, I was just curious to understand that before diagnosis, the symptoms that typically women present with, like the you know all the bloating and the um, other symptoms that you just mentioned, when they present with the recurrence, is is it the same symptoms or it could be different or what is it that we are watching out for? Is perhaps that's what I'm trying to understand here for patients sure. more actively surveying the, this thing, yeah. So um, for those patients that come back with symptoms, the symptoms frequently are very similar to what they presented with initially. Right. Um, we do try to, to catch recurrence earlier than that uh, with our surveillance. And maybe we need to take a step back and kind of think about what, what we do when, we, when a patient first presents. And, so a patient comes in, they have all these symptoms, we get imaging and we see a large mass in the ovary and maybe see ascites, which is the fluid collecting in the abdomen or evidence of spread of the cancer to other sites. Um, if they have a lot of ascites and in particular, if they have um, difficulty uh, carrying out all their normal daily activities or have very um, um, difficult uh, ability to walk very far or, or to exercise, you know, limited exercise capacity, then generally we'll try and get a biopsy, identify the cancer, and then treat with chemotherapy to make all the fluid go away, which usually helps the patients um, recover quite a bit of their function and their nutrition and makes uh, the surgery a much easier surgery for them to tolerate. Right. Um, and then we'll move on to further chemotherapy. Um, once, generally the first line of chemotherapy is six cycles of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Generally it includes at least carboplatinum, um, frequently paclitaxel, and if surgery is not in the near future, then we would include frequently bevacizumab or Avastin. Mm -hmm. um, the chemotherapy, the first two drugs generally only go for six months, and the bevacizumab can go up to a year, uh, depending upon what's happening. Also, at that initial presentation, many of the cancers, uh, particularly the high-grade serous and in the metroid cancers, do have a genetic predisposition. Um, so somebody in the family may have had a gene that they passed on to the patient yeah. that increased the risk of cancer. And so Genetic testing is very important um, in these patients. That helps us identify what genes may be contributing to the development of cancer, both in the patient as well as other family members. So we know what to look for. It also can help us better select treatment options. Absolutely. And then there's a second thing that we do generally up front, 
um, is we look at the cancer itself, doing something called next-gen sequencing or molecular profiling of the cancer, where companies take the cancer and they look at, at up to 300 plus genes and look at how they're modified to, to cause the cancer to grow and to met metastasize. Those two tests really help in selecting personalized treatment for that patient for their cancer. Mm -hmm. so, so having that information up front is very, very important and can affect whether bevacizumab is the right treatment or whether a PARP inhibitor or some other targeted therapy is very important. So once, once we get all that information and we treated a patient, they've had their surgery, had their chemotherapy, there's no evidence of disease, then we move into surveillance. And after um, or during surveillance, we generally watch patients every three months for the first two years and um, every three to six months um, following that. During that time, we'll do physical exam, blood tests, and imaging on a regular basis, looking for evidence of recurrence. Many times the cancer grows back slowly and the blood tests may indicate that the cancer is coming back before we can find it with CT scans or PET scans or any other kind of imaging or physical exam. And that gives us a little bit of a head start uh, to find the cancer and treat it before it causes any symptoms to the patient. And how we surveil right now, it, our best uh, surveillance is CA125 for many of these cancers. However, there is something on the horizon for patients that may prove to be more sensitive and more specific. And it, this goes back to using that molecular profiling. Um, so if we get the molecular profile up front, we know what genes are altered in the cancer. And then we can look for evidence of those genes in the bloodstream at each visit to see if the cancer is coming back. And that there are several companies that are developing that technology now and slowly moving into the clinical arena. And we, and I would say in the next couple of years, you're probably going to see a shift away from CA125 and more towards this uh, genetic testing um, to see if the cancer is recurred. Thank you for all that great information. Actually, I was going to ask you about the role of surveillance, but you address most of it anyway. So um, so it sounds like every three months when these patients are being followed, uh, several tests are being done so, so that you know, you can catch the cancer coming back earlier than later. Typically speaking, how many of the how many of, of these recurrences do you think the overcomers have in general, just broadly speaking? Is it one or two or multiple times that the cancer comes back or for, for the majority of the population? So um, when we treat a patient up front with ovarian cancer and we get an excellent response, and um, don't see any evidence of disease at the completion of treatment, we like to monitor how long they go without treatment before the cancer comes back. And that can be very telling um, as to what the future holds. Mm -hmm. And those patients that um, where the cancer does not come back for one year, 18 months, two years, something like that, those patients generally um, have a very long life expectancy and are likely to have um, multiple different treatment regimens over their lifetime. Uh, it could be up to six, seven, eight or more treatments. Um, other patients where the cancer comes back almost immediately after finishing uh, chemotherapy suggest that their cancer is not quite as sensitive to chemotherapy and they're gonna have a chronic disease process. Mm -hmm. And they're, they can be a little bit more challenging to treat. Um, the, those cancers tend not to respond as rapidly or as completely to chemotherapy. Um, and they also may have difficulty, um, or we may have difficulty inducing a response with other directed therapies, the targeted therapies from the molecular profile. Okay. Thank you uh, for the clarification. So. Um, we, we talked about multiple lines of therapies. So 
can you tell us a little bit more about all these subsequent lines of therapies that are available to the patients one, once the cancer comes back? And um, how do you choose patients for one particular kind of therapy versus the other um, for recurrences? So, um, so when the patient recurs, we go back to how, how long it is from their last treatment. Okay. And if it's been a significant length of time, say six months or a year, then many times the chemotherapy drugs that we used initially are likely to work again. Mm. Uh, and so we tend to go back to those particular drugs, um, whether it's carboplatinum, paclitaxel, or, or something else, uh, just depends upon really what uh, side effects the patient incurred the first time around mm -hmm. and what they can tolerate the second time. And um, so if a patient, for example, has a bad peripheral neuropathy and it, it's impairing their ability to function, we may not be able to use drugs like paclitaxel again. Mm -hmm. so, um, so toxicity or the toxicity from the prior treatment plays a role in selecting our next treatment options um, as well as how sensitive the cancer is. And then going back to the molecular profile, that too is very important. So if we identify that the patient has, for example, a BRCA mutation, um, then those patients are excellent candidates for PARP inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be another option. Or if there's other unique um, uh, targets that we can use from that molecular profile, then they too can be very helpful in the overall treatment of the patient. Thank you, Dr. Lucci. So uh, we were talking about, you know, patients not responding, uh, some patients not responding um, as well to the chemotherapy. So this brings this is a great segue to my next question, which was, um, which is that, you know, how do you, how does a patient overcome the uh, primary or acquired drug resistance? And so when a particular patient does not, option doesn't work for the patient, what are the implications for her um, in terms of future direction? So um, the current standard of therapy for patients that we consider to be um, platinum resistant, meaning that yeah. the platinum did not work. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it may have made the cancer shrink a little bit, but it didn't go away or it came back right after we finished treatment. Those patients, um, the standard chemotherapy is the paclitaxel uh, administered on a weekly basis right now. That um, can have some um, effect and de definitely can prolong life and control the cancer for some period of time, but it's not a very long period that um, that, that is expected to work. There's been tremendous interest uh, in that particular group of patients. And there's a number of different drugs out there right now that are in clinical trials. Right. Um, and I think the best thing for those patients is to look for a clinical trial that they may fit into. The alternatives are going back to the molecular profile or to immunotherapy as alternatives um, if they have the appropriate uh, markers to indicate that they would be responsive to that. Okay. Yeah. So I was, as you know, I mean, immunotherapy is promising, but it also presents with its own challenges, you know, because it is still not proven to be 100% effective in ovarian cancer. Although, to your point, there are several clinical trials, even in immunotherapy that's are, that are open these days. Hopefully in the next couple of years to five years, we'll see a lot more advances. But right now, the the options for uh, platinum resistant patients still kind of limited at this point in time, you know, I, I feel. Uh, you are correct. And most of the um, treatments that are under development are totally unique um, mechanisms of action to try and get away from our traditional chemotherapy because we know that that doesn't work very well. Yeah. So we are trying to find alternative ways to attack the cancer that um, would get around the resistance issue. Yeah. And that's why clinical trials are so important in this category. Exactly, thank you. So, um, so you talked about you know several things um, 
in the pipeline and clinical trials. So what, in your opinion, have been the biggest breakthroughs in ovarian cancer in the past couple of years, just going back to, um, to the past a little bit? And what do you envision the immediate future to be? Yeah, so, um, so I've been practicing gynecologic oncology since uh, about 1988. And so I've seen a lot of changes over that period of time. It's been a while. Yeah. And um, I would say in the last 10 or 15 years, we've had several major breakthroughs. And one is I have to give credit to the molecular profiling. Um, we've been hearing about this for years and years, even way back when I first started training. Um, and we're finally getting to a point where we better understand these molecular profiles and how to use them in treatment. And they're really directing um, future development of uh, new clinical um, uh, drugs or treatment regimens. Um, I think immunotherapy is another one that has been a major change. And you're right, um, most of the ovarian cancers don't have the right markers for a good response to chemo or to immunotherapy. And, but those that do have the markers do respond very well. Mm -hmm. And it can be a very different kind of experience for patients that have say Lynch syndrome and have a lot of good targets for the immunotherapy or um, another category is the pull E mutation, which also creates a lot of targets for the immunotherapy. So, so there are certain groups that really, really respond well. Um, granted, they're small, but there are definitely groups there. Um, so those are two. Um, the next one is um, the PARP inhibitors. I think that that has been a major change, and that goes back to the molecular profile, um, and that we were able to identify um, a, actually, it's a whole group of different genes that impact the way patients are able to repair their DNA. And the PARP inhibitors um, further um, block DNA repair, which um, accelerates the response to um, treatments. And so that's been a very effective treatment. Um, I think in the future, we're gonna continue to develop these molecular profiles and better understand how the different um, molecular pathways within the cancer interact. And I think we'll see um, more and more combined therapies where we attack multiple different um, uh, pathways that are driving the cancer at the same time. Mm -hmm. So a PARP inhibitor plus something else um, right. and, or um, something like a Gleevec or Herceptin plus something else. And so we'll be using more and more of these directed therapies and hopefully fewer chemotherapy drugs in the future. Yeah. And so this brings me to my next question that, you know, I read this uh, statement somewhere or uh, heard from someone that every patient with ovarian cancer should be treated with a PARP. Do you agree? I mean, and do you agree with that statement? Why or why not? <laughs> um, I'm certain the drug companies would like us to believe that, but, <laughs> but I'm not convinced. I, um, when we go back to the molecular profile, we can predict those patients that are likely to have a very good response to the PARP inhibitors, where they can have a complete response where all the cancer goes away and stays away for a long time. And we also have a group of patients where it's very unlikely that the PARP inhibitor is going to have any impact at all. Mm -hmm. And in, in the patients that in the clinical trials, at least, when we looked at the patients that were really sensitive, they can get a 12 months or longer out of the PARP inhibitors with a good response. Those that don't have as all the markers um, can still have a response, but it only improves the time to progression. It doesn't necessarily make the cancer go away, but it may delay the cancer from growing um, in a way that we can measure it yeah. for anywhere from zero to maybe three months. Mm. It's not a huge change. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, as a result of that, 
there's been a move to put the PARP inhibitors in, in a situation of maintenance therapy where the patient does not have any measurable cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't see it on CT scan or measure it with blood tests or other things. And we can put them on the PARP inhibitors and hopefully delay the recurrence um, to, to prolong their disease-free interval. I still have concerns about that and that um, if we can predict which patients are not likely to benefit from that, and we know that the PARP inhibitors have side effects, particularly if, they're, if patients are on the drug for a long period of time, I think it may alter our ability to treat them effectively when the cancer comes back. So I, I think um, there, there is a large group of people out there that believe that. I am not one of them. I, I would like to focus more on quality of life, trying to get away from treatments that are not necessary or not necessarily beneficial, especially if they carry potential side effects that may limit our options in the future. And thank you so much for your um, candid comment on that, because, you know, you mentioned zero to three months, uh, you know, could be the benefit for those patients where PARP is not not likely to make a very big impact, right? So zero, zero to three months is for some patients and families, I know from just being a family member that it could mean a significant amount of time. But again, to your point, if there are a lot of side effects, a lot of toxicity involved with the PARP and it where it um, compromises your quality of life. And then also PARP is expensive. Let's, you know, sure. let's talk about that for a second. I mean, not every person or every family are able to afford PARP inhibitors. So taking all of that collectively, it, it has to be a prudent decision for from both the healthcare team and the, and the patient um, to kind of determine whether PARP is the right answer for everyone, every ovarian cancer, every overcomer involved, right? So uh, I cannot, you know, say enough for for your candid statement on that. Thank you for mentioning it, because this really helps all of us understand that, yes, PARP is a powerful tool that we have, but, you know, we also have to kind of balance, especially for patients where it is not going to likely not going to make a very big impact. So um, thank you for that. Um, so uh, I wanted to chat with you a little bit of a sur about survivorship because at our annual conference, you gave such a great presentation on survivorship that most of our online people missed. So uh, we know that, you know, it's, a, it's an anxious phase and uh, when people, when patients are on survivorship, they are not seen as frequently by the healthcare team. So it brings in a lot of uncertainty. So what is your guidance to our overcomers in embracing the survivorship in, in the best possible way? And what should they do during this phase? And what are they watching out for? Yeah, so um, that is a very intriguing question. And, um, and when we talk to survivors, there's a lot of different emotions that they're going through. And many of the patients are experiencing uh, menopausal syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of that, their emotions may be rather labile to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then you can superimpose on that um, what we call survivor's guilt, where they wonder why they are the one that is still alive and may not have any evidence of cancer when so many other women die of the cancer or so many other family members mm -hmm. uh, may have died of the same cancer. And um, all of those things together can contribute to a, a severe depression. And um, with regard to the healthcare provider, we see two different responses. One is that they become very dependent on seeing us and being told that their cancer's responding or not present or whatever. But on the other hand, some of my survivor patients will come back and tell me, I get so anxious before I come in to see you mm -hmm. because I'm afraid you're going to tell me the cancer's back. Right. And so they almost prefer not to come in. Mm -hmm. And so um, navigating all of those different emotions can be quite challenging. Um, and other things that happen to survivors we know that many women, when they're diagnosed with any cancer, ovarian cancer included, 
um, will have a significant change in their interpersonal relationships, mm -hmm. their financial status. Their, um, they may go from having a, a good job with good insurance and, um, and money in a savings account to uh, losing their significant other, to losing their job, maybe even losing their home, and maybe in debt from all the expenses of healthcare. And so it can be a, a really difficult transition for survivors to navigate all that. Um, that's why I think it's very important that patients, when they're diagnosed, um, as well as throughout their journey um, with cancer, have frank uh, conversations with their doctor about what's important to them. Um, what do they want to accomplish in their life? What what events may be occurring in their life that they want to be there for or be available for or not be sick for and um, help us help you control your life. Mm -hmm. um, let us help you enjoy your life um, while we we're going through all of this uh, turmoil and, um, and give you some control. Also take an inventory of those things that you have to be grateful for and um, the people that are still in your life, the ones that you know have stood by you and have supported you and, and been there for you and, and the people that, uh, that really um, are there to make your life easier. And then also to look at all the other things that um, may be available to you, such as other opportunities for um, employment or other opportunities for um, getting involved socially or donating time and effort to um, projects like yours right. um, to help other women that may be going through similar uh, events or similar changes in their life. And I think um, uh, trying to keep all the downside in perspective, trying to regain control of your environment and of your life identifying what um, important goals you would like to achieve and finding ways to pursue those and using the network of people that have stayed around you and been supportive mm -hmm. to help you get there is all very important in the long-term survivorship. That's such a wonderful answer. Thank you, Dr. Lucci. So you mentioned patients um, coming to you and saying they were so anxious before they came, right? So I'm going to ask you this question that we understand that anxiety can be the biggest, um, it's it's probably one of the biggest top three concerns uh, the survivors and our overcomers have about the cancer coming back, right? So, um, and even though we went through the whole role of surveillance, how the doctors and the healthcare teams do their best in trying to catch the cancer early if it comes or just kind of, you know, um, just watching over it, we know in certain situations, in many situations, it is unavoidable. Um, and so is the anxiety related to it. So as a provider to your uh, patients and to your survivors, what is your guidance to somehow manage this anxiety that comes with the fear of cancer coming back we know there is no magic answer to it because everyone everyone comes to it from a different angle but just from your years of experience uh you know providing care for these patients what guidance would you give us well um one is don't skip your appointments right. <laughs> so, so um those appointments are helpful and important in allowing us to uh, identify the cancer early if it is going to come back and do more about uh, trying to control the cancer before it becomes um, too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. But I think um, don't let the anxiety or concern paralyze you from doing the right things that will help you in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, I think, again, um, if you have the attitude that you're going to be in control, that you have the ability to make decisions for yourself, you have the autonomy, mm -hmm. I, I think that relieves a lot of the anxiety as well, because um, so many times I hear from patients that um, they're surprised 
if I suggest to them that they may have options to change the schedule of their chemotherapy or their medications, depending upon their travel schedule or their social schedule or other things where they thought the cancer's totally taken over their life mm. and they have to come in on this schedule, they have to do um, certain treatments on this schedule that there's no flexibility in the system. And, um, and giving up that autonomy can be um, a big part of their anxiety. Okay. So uh, helping patients identify um, what's important, what's not important, and how we can adapt to their needs, uh, I think is one way to help relieve the anxiety. That's a wonderful response. Thank you, Dr. Lucci. So um, you seem to be thinking ahead of your time in, in terms of what the patients need and what they want. So if you could change one thing in the care spectrum of ovarian cancer, what would that be? So the first would be to improve our um, screening uh, yes. techniques and identify the cancers earlier so that we have a better chance at curing them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that would be the most important thing. And um, I don't know that there's any major breakthroughs, unfortunately, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, there are some uh, companies that are offering blood tests similar to these molecular diagnostics where you can go in and get a blood test and it screens for up to 50 different cancers and such. I don't know how effective they are for ovarian cancer specifically. Mm -hmm. um, that data is not readily available. And I think that there needs to be a lot more studies at looking at these uh, genetic tests um, as a means of early diagnosis. Um, I, another thing that I would like to change is um, I think we need better support for survivors. Yeah. And I, unfortunately, uh, we don't have good infrastructure support for survivors in a lot of situations. And many of your people may have heard of uh, Gilda's Club as one example of a, um, a very strong environment that can provide wonderful resources to patients. And um, it'd be great to have some something like that available here in the greater Houston area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we I, I we have actually worked with um, Gilda's Club, and they are they're a wonderful organization. Um, so thank you for definitely mentioning that. So uh, we do actually we have support groups that we offer to our survivors um, online. We, we we used to do that in person, but now we have moved online, and because of COVID. But now with that, anyone from anywhere they are able to join these monthly support groups that we do. And so you're absolutely right in that, that we do need to provide that community, that support to our overcomers, because that's the only way outside of the medical support. And, you know, they can get some emotional, psychological, spiritual, even kind of a support to as they walk this journey. So very, very important. Thank you, Dr. Lucci. So um, final question as we uh, wrap up this conversation and thank you for all your brilliant advice. Um, what message of overcoming would you like to share with our audience? Well, um, I, again, I think it has to do with autonomy. So um, please have the conversation with your physicians, with your family, with all those that are important to you as to what's um, important uh, in your life, uh, what things you need to have control over, and, um, and how we can maintain a high quality of life uh, for you while under, undertaking this journey. We know that patients that um, have a positive attitude uh, throughout this process and um, have a uh, commitment to overcoming that those patients live longer. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we take away all the things that make life worth living, um, I think that that is going to have a negative impact in many different ways. So please, please communicate with us. Let us know what's important. And um, also, uh, I would also 
like to emphasize the fact that the support groups really need to be extended to the larger family or circle of friends and other support people because they they too, when they see a loved one going through all this are suffering um, quite a lot and need some support and uh, and need to know how to emotionally and and physically deal with the uh, with the difficulty. And that too can help keep the family unit together and keep everybody um, supportive and keep uh, the patient um, uh, happy, healthy, and more in line med mentally and physically to um, to endure the treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucci, for that uh, you know recognition of the caregivers because it is a twenty four seven job uh which you know uh, there is such a thing as caregiver burnout as you and it's so important to take care of mind and body of the caregivers as well if you have if you are providing care to someone else you have to take care of yourself first so that you are able to provide that level of care to your loved one so very very important that um, we also recognize and support the entire caregiver community. I know that I have been one. I'm still one. So it's it's a, it's a it's a we are grateful for this role, but it also comes with its own challenges. So um, thank you for that recognition. So thank you so much, Dr. Lucci, for this fabulous conversation. We learned so much from you today. Thank you for your great uh, expert insights and most importantly for your compassion for our overcomers and for you know for understanding the journey that they're going through. We we truly appreciate you and your expertise and your time and knowledge that you shared with us today. And overcomers, we will be back with the next episode with uh, of Connect Over Coffee very soon. Until then you stay tuned and keep overcoming thank you and bye